Okay, now to, to um, this evening's program, which is part of the um, Dialogues Towards a Culture of, of Peace series, which is put on in cooperation with the International Peace Foundation, and I'm pleased to welcome them here this evening too. Um, Anita Roddick <coughs> is the founder and co-chair. Founder and co-chair, just the founder, thank you, of The Body Shop, um, a firm which has grown in a quarter century from one small place in Brighton to a worldwide retailer with um, the number of outlets are going up as we talk. Uh, the, a worldwide retailer with 2010, uh, 2010 outlets worldwide, 32 of them in Thailand, and um, spread worldwide over 52 countries. Uh, in the process of developing this business, uh, Anita Roddick has become a leader of the movement for social responsibility in business. Believing that commerce is primarily about human relationships, she has impressed upon her company an absolute belief in respect for human rights, environmental protection, concern for animal welfare, and a dedication to employees and community, as well as shareholders. The result is an enterprise voted the second most trusted brand in the UK and ranked by the Financial Times as the 27th most respected company in the world. Although the body shop has had some difficult years financially, it has survived and regained momentum, vindicating its, its founder's belief that commerce with a conscience is not only a moral imperative, but a competitive advantage as well. Ms. Roddick is the author of several books, including Body and Soul, Business as Usual, Take It Personally, How to Make Conscious Choices to Change the World, and A Revolution in Kindness. And these books, or some of them, I understand, are for sale um, at the door. And we're, I'll remind you about that later, if I may. So, Anita Roddick was made a Dame of the Order of the British Empire last year in recognition of her lifelong work in retailing the environment and charity. Okay, so um, Anita's going to talk to us on the subject of corporate social responsibility and community trade. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a privilege to welcome Anita Roddick. He warned me that there's going to be lots of chatter around the bar. So I said, how do you stop it? And he said, I've got my minders at the back. Um, I'm not quite sure whether I'm in the company of friends or foe, when I'm in the company of writers, correspondents, or journalists. Sometimes there's this sort of cynicism, especially you see it or hear and experience in the United Kingdom, which takes the cover of insight. And yet, for me, it's always been seen as lack of moral courage. Sometimes, as I've met around the world, some of the bravest and most remarkable journalists fighting issues, bringing stories that are beyond or below the, the sort of the radar screen. Stories that have broken in the media, sometimes, sometimes with no support at all. So, as I said, I don't quite know whether I'm in the, in the company yet of friends or foes. Um, I, I've got a title for this uh, talk for the next few minutes, which is really the title of the lectures that I'm giving in universities, but somehow or another I want to change it because this is too intimate um, a meeting place. I mean, you're eating, you're drinking, my wine's left over there, so I've got to gobble down water. And I want to be able to at least not only challenge uh, some of the thinking that has seemed to be de rigueur in business, I, I believe, as Gloria Steinem says, or said, that if I, we come here today and there's no trouble tomorrow, I haven't done my job. And I think there will be a, a group of you here that will resonate with some of, the, uh, some of the topics I have and some of the belief systems that I have. And some of you will just think I'm a hippy-dippy capitalist. So what well, remains to be seen. I'm... I believe that what we need is businesses that are so powerful now 
that are powerful, that we need them to have a moral imperative in everything they do. This is what I passionately believe. I believe we need trade that respects communities, supports families, respects the work of women, respects human rights, that every international or national trading relationship should have human rights at its very center. I believe that passionately. I believe if we make a mess, we should clean it up or be penalized. I think we should be banned from going onto the stock market or any other public flotations if we do injurious work. I believe every product should be banned coming into any country if it's touched with child slavery or sweatshop labor. I believe this passionately. I believe it so passionately, I've said quite openly, I would never break bread with anybody who knows the heinous behavior of Walmart and still chooses to shop there. I believe that we are, those that are now in control, those that are now in control, economic governments, politicians and business people will drive us off the edge. I believe global planning institutions like the IMF, like the World Bank, and especially, especially that secretive, almost illegal in its behavior, the World Trade Organization are ignoring mounting evidence of impending social catastrophe and will leave us widespread and a dangerous sort of inequality and insecurity. I don't believe any of these institutions, any of them, are working for the majority of humanity. And I believe that the roots of conflict aren't found amongst the dispossessed and the poor, they're found within our own global policies that lead them to retaliation. As I've traveled in areas like Upper Niger, and I've seen, you know, they don't know the word desertification, but they understand when they hold a child dying of lack of water. I believe that many of us are just so immune to these disasters, which gives us a huge spiritual poverty in that, at this sort of indifference to this global dilemma that we have. I, I don't know about you, but I don't like living in a world where there's no predictable future, a world in which governments offer control and terror in place of the pursuit of happiness, or a world in which war criminals are called leaders. I'm tired, so bloody tired, of a world where our media lie day after day, urging masses of us, driven by fear and greed, to swallow the lies and turn on each other, seeking the enemy on whom we can vent our rage. I'm tired, so tired of a world where there's no sense of shared interest or shared belief. It seems to me that there's no moral or altruistic or spiritual center to our culture. I don't know about you, but I feel my country is falling apart. Maybe America is falling apart. Maybe Italy is falling apart. When men are sort of prepared to commit the crimes of preemptive war, germ warfare, trying to impose law and order, and they failed because the young, especially the dissenting young, the protesters, have, know that they have the right of to power because they are numerous and because they are directly affected by what is going on. I believe that the law is suspect and disorder is built into a system. The courts are revealed as agents of control, not justice. Corporate globalization and capitalism is engaged in a never-ending social and economic warfare. Profit is now seen as a form of theft, War profit is a form of murder. Land, water, and air polluted for profits and stolen by the privatization mantra. Police take the law into their own hands using terror to crush the spirit of dissent, which have I been affected personally on the streets of Seattle and offends their own mechanical lives. They will fail. Change will never, ever, ever come by our government. They are economic governments. My government is an economic government. This ec government seems to be an economic government, and America is an economic government. They don't measure their greatness by how they look after the weak and the frail. They are economic governments. Change will only come by a sort of group of moral dissenters and to the persistence of small committed groups of people who are willing to fail over a very sort of long periods of time until that rare and that wonderful moment when the dam of oppression and indifference and greed finally cracks and those in power finally accept what the world's people have been saying all along, that there now has to be a revolution in kindness, where to help the, po the, the biggest catastrophe we face, which is poverty, work for small-scale economic solutions. 
it would be a really, I know I don't know about you, I'm probably one of the oldest people here, but it would be a lifetime's work to clear away all these fatuous fantasies and false promises that have been painted in our mind layer after layer over long periods of time by the advertising and the communications media, on the millions of billboards, in the prints, in the electronic ads, in the language of myth and persuasion. And if we will accept what we are told, that it is apparently inevitable that the media and our political and economic leaders market the future us, then I think what we're doing is just be, being merely the audience of our own demise. I believe that it's time to, uh, to declare that a trade, any trade at all, lacking justice, e equity, decency and compassion is, to, is no longer acceptable. I believe economics, efficiency perception, brutish power in calculations no longer survive. I believe absolutely just at the real start where the bottom line has bottomed out. That's my passion and change. For 28 years I've been working in the business either within it or on the periphery of it. And I've gone where no CEO ever goes. I've traveled with vagabonds. I've spent my time in the slums of Bangladesh. I spend my life in the epicenters of resistance, which is not the modus operandi of, of, of uh, the, the CEOs. And I bring back stories. My life is storytelling. And I believe that storytelling is the great myths and legends of what make any of us great. It's a form of education. And the Celts, the Celts, they knew better than anybody the power of storytelling. They said, if all teachers should be poets, because knowledge, unless it goes through the heart, is dangerous. So when I founded my company or my business, and I, I have to tell you, hand on heart, I shouldn't be here. I had no, it was a series of amazing accidents that made me sit, that got me to this place. I never went to business school, thank God. I'd never read a book on economic theory, thank God. I'd never heard of Milton Friedman, thank God. I didn't believe that business was financial science. It was trading. It was having a, a product so good that somebody was willing to buy it and therefore give a profit to it. I believe that everything in life was subject to change. Life and that, that, and that you know, nothing, nothing, was, nothing was important, and especially a moisture cream. I mean, I didn't talk about my products as if they were the body and blood of Jesus Christ. There were emulsions that worked, like every other emulsion worked. But what I had, what I garnered in the community of the body shop in those early days, was the sense that enthusiasm, if it goes through the heart, is absolutely unstoppable. And the language I'm using is poetic in some cases and metaphysical in some cases, but that is exactly the language what we need in business now. We need business to have this new language, this new creative thinking, because what we've got now is these, these things invading our brains and stealing with us any sense of compassion, because our language is now economic. How many of you have ever said in your life, how long have I invested in this relationship? Everything has an economic value now. Our life has ac economic values. For the first time in our cultural history, we have economics that pervade everything. Whether you go to the favelas in Brazil and see the children with their scars across their body where they're selling their organs onto the Western market, or whether you see you know, women's work which is never recorded on any, uh, any sort of uh, sense of economic screen because women's work is unrecognized unless the only work that is unrecognized is its production for the West. And I, you know, there's something so singularly sad about, a, about a, a culture where economic values supersede even compassion and joy and change and creativity. You know, I would like to come across a, a business lexicon that calls, talks about creation or talks of the human spirit, where the production of more in a company is alongside the production of the human spirit. I'd like to have a, a notion where we have a barometer of measurement in terms of joy in the workplace which has done, which has been done, continues to be done, but never recognized as such. I would like to see um, a sort of a, the un totally unimaginative bottom line, that profit and loss, where the only measurement is accumulation of money, include the responsibility of trade justice, workers' justice, and human rights, and, and the protection of the environment. I don't know about you, but I don't give a toss about any company's wealth creation. I give, a, uh, I give a, a, an absolute endearment to a company that creates jobs. 
that creates a responsibility in the, in the corporation and the community that gives back to the community, not for cause related marketing because it's a good thing to do because it's a passion within the community. Opening up the body shop as I did some 28 years ago, um, it was, as I said earlier on, it was an accident. My husband, who was Scots and therefore quite mad, decided to ride a horse from Buenos Aires to New York. Now I can tell you, when you've got two kids and you're eating your cornflakes, when he says, I think I want to do this trip. Well, I'm a child of the hippie 60s, and anybody that has a passion and a vision had a you know, vote on my side. So go with, go with it, Gordon, I said. Let's sell one of our a cafe that we had. And off he went. And he unfortunately arrived in, in Argentina just when the junta had happened. And he was holed up there for a couple of months. Then he bought some horses. And then he rode uh, through, uh, through Argentina. And then he got into Paraguay and was accepted into Paraguay by a support system of few crazy nuns and priests. And then he crossed uh, the Chapas and he was there for about a year and a half and one of the horses died and he had to, he had to come back home. Well, then we were going off to uh, Australia where we were opening up a pineapple plantation. Unfortunately, I'd opened up a body shop. And that was a singly strange experience because the body shop, when I went to ask for the 4,000 miserable pounds loan from the Barclays miserable bank, and they didn't want to give me the loan, and to this day, they are still deeply, deeply stupid. Um, and they wouldn't give me the loan because I was, brought my two kids to the bank. You never bring your kids to the bank, ladies, if you want a, if you want a loan, because they really don't want you to have a sex life, and they don't want you to be seen to be a wife or a mother. This is the realm of m male territory. And it didn't help by wearing a pair of jeans and a Bob Dylan t-shirt and my kids scrawling around in his, uh, underneath his desk. He didn't give me the bank manager the loan. He gave it to my husband, Gordon, who said, uh, who was, you know, looking like a bloke and very serious bloke. And we had a profit and loss sheet. We had no idea what it, we were talking about, but we had a plastic folder and they were very impressive in the early 70s, plastic folders. Anyway, he gave Gordon a miserable 4,000 pounds, and with that, Gordon went off to Argentina, and I opened up the body shop. Now, everything I did, I did wrong, according to any marketing manual. I opened my shop stuck between two funeral parlors. Never open a body shop between two funeral parlors, because every time the, every time the coffins would pass, there'd be some outrage from the solicitors of the funeral parlors who told me to cease and desist and take the, the name off. Well, I don't know about you. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I've always loved those B movies where the anonymous phone call, and one of the biggest tricks for being an entrepreneur is use the anonymous phone call. So I rang up the Brighton Argus and said, I'm, I'm a young mother of two children whose husband has deserted her in uh, going to ride a horse from Buenos Aires to New York. Thank you. And uh, that was a good story. And has opened up a shop called The Body Shop in Brighton. Oh, Brighton's first sex shop. That was a good story. And now being intimidated by mafia undertakers. With that, they had a, a gaggle of stories, and I never looked back. And to be one of the so-called top brands, a word I hate, um, without any advertising, I think is pretty good which means that, you know, what we used was guerrilla tactics. Everything we did was about communication stories. Um, so we used to, I set up the body shop, opened up another couple of stores. Gordon came back and he decided to stay. Now, I don't know about you, but entrepreneurs are crazy people. They have nothing in common with going to business school. Business school will shave away and squash out any entrepreneurship because because the entrepreneurs have an obsession with freedom. They are, they are like, um, they, have a, they, have a, they have a strange, dis, strange childhood. They have a lost childhood. They have an incredible work ethic. Their lost childhood usually means that somehow they've been forced to have responsibility. Um, they've, they're, they're crazy, they vision things. We vision things, we keep on thinking. We have this like the genie in the bottle where we vomit ideas. Um, but we're useless, absolutely useless at process. We don't like five-year plans, we don't like hierarchy, we don't like 10-year plans, one-year plans. We, we don't like any damn plan. 
What we just have is an idea. And unfortunately, unless we can find somebody to process the ideas, the idea is everything. For us to have an idea is like the creative spirit at play, but processing is totally irrelevant to us. And then an uh, entrepreneur is almost like the thumbprint they put on this, this blank sheet they have. And you go to the table with who your personality is. And I'm an activist. I was born, I came out of the womb challenging the system. I'll go to the grave challenging the system. Because dissent is the sort of behavior pattern of any literate society. When we don't like our leaders, political leaders or authoritarian leaders, we know how to dissent and protest. And that was what my, 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 my makeup was. It was sort of formed to me by a mother who hated, hated the local priest. And that made it very unfortunate because I was a Roman Catholic. And she used to throw buckets of dirty water at the priest because he didn't want to give my dad a ca Catholic burial. And then not deterred by that, she had her four kids and she squashed garlic on the edge of our hems of our skirt and frog marched us into church to sit in the front pew so we would irritate like hell the local priest and stink out the w wonderful incense. So the Perilli children were going down the aisle stinking of garlic. Well, nothing, nothing, nothing prepares you for a normal life if you have a mother like that. And if you have teachers, and I had a most amazing teacher called Sister Immaculate Conception. Well, with a name like that, things are going to be interesting. And she taught me the power of language. At 10 years old, I didn't even know the expression, the power of language. She taught me, as Wittgenstein said, words create your world. And all of us 10-year-old kids in the convent school had to look after the local tramps. But we weren't allowed to call them tramps. We had to call them knights of the road. Now, at 10 years old, you had these romantic ideas that these tramps were not tramps. They were, they were members of the Knights of the Round Table. Somewhere King Arthur was floating around in these, in these guises. And another teacher, Miss Springham, who had the deepest, bluest eyeshadow, she taught me about social justice through the writers, the great social writers and the great reporters of the 30s, John Steinbeck, taught me at John Dos Passos, William Faulkner, and my education and outrage came by writers like that. And a, a, another point of outrage uh, developed my spirit in sense of a uh, sense of empathy with the human condition was the most magnificent um, photographic exhibition in America in the early 50s called The Family of Man. Many of you may have heard of it, may have not heard of it, designed by Edward Steichen, one of the great photographers in that, in that era. And that talked about and showed through the most extraordinary photographs and quotations, the joy and the, and the, the beauty in relationships and family of man, and the, the evil inherent in the lie. Well, it doesn't, it is no wonder when I was a student and when I got a scholarship to study uh, for my education thesis uh, in Israel in the early 60s, when it was my first tangible experience of community based on the land. And community is a safe place. It's where people protect each other. And the community knows much better than the state or the nation what protects a community. So when I left that with that experiences and trying to marry every Jewish guy in the world after that and failing miserably, trying to convert to Judaism, being chucked out because the rabbi said I had to be more, I had more in common with the persecuted than the persecutors. So I left and I thought, well, what next? Teaching was what I went to. And teaching was quite extraordinary in the 60s. But what it did, it gave me this ability to communicate. And every leadership's total greatest quality has to be communication. Because as a leader, whether a leader in business or a leader in writing or a leader in whatever area you are, if you cannot communicate well, you're just not there. So leadership and communication is essential. Well, part of the, part of the roots of um, my travels, which was my, my, my university without walls, I traveled in the 60s, which was quite extraordinary because travel wasn't available unless you were middle class then. Um, so I traveled and I lived in communities for three months in the Tahitian, Polynesian Islands, Mauritius, Madagascar, Africa, Australia, India. And what it taught me was something remarkable, but which is that this wisdom that is so ignored by our society, this, this indigenous wisdom, and especially the wisdom of women who support the community, protect the community almost more than anything. 
And after coming back with these, with these stories and learning how to protect my body, you live in Tahiti where the women have bodies like velvet. They have no teeth, but they have bodies like velvet. And they're, they're shoving this thing called, you know, it looks like cooking lard, but it's called cocoa butter on their bodies. Or you go to Sri Lanka, and in the old days called Ceylon, and you used to see the women eating pineapples and then taking the, sk the inner skin and rubbing it on their bodies. They had a trick, they had knowledge. So this is what I garnered when I opened up the body shop. So going into the past is a prolog for my, prolog for my, for my thinking. But uh, those travels, those travels gave me an indelible print that the biggest catastrophe we face is poverty. Not only economic poverty, but poverty of imagination that doesn't give people the tools to get out of poverty, which television should be doing, but which you know, is just about celebrity and entertainment and fashion. And spiritual poverty, spiritual poverty in our society, where we don't give a damn, as I said, that, that people are living on a dollar a day. We just don't give a damn, as long as our, our way of life is protected. So it's no wonder when the body shop stone started that I was going to do things differently. I couldn't read a profit and loss sheet. I didn't believe it was financial science. It was, you know, for me, it was about, you know, the, the only true path in life is through work and love. And, you know, my mum used to say, you know, when she used to come into the body shop in those days, oh, it reminds me of the, how I ran my house in the Second World War. You recycled everything, you refilled everything. That's good housekeeping. I didn't have any money. I only had 700 pounds to, to to develop these products, and they were only 20, and they were pretty pathetic. So I did a great thing, a marketing idea, which I didn't know it was marketing. I put five sizes of everything, so it looked like I had lots of products. We had little explanations. <laughs> we had explanations because they were so terrible. I mean, the lettuce lotion went rancid because we bought it from Italy, and you don't trust anything you buy in Italy in those days. So I used to say, don't worry about the lettuce, it's just gone rancid, it's good on the skin. And then we had, because I'm a historian, I used to read Pliny, who was like the gossip colonist, and he was talking about how the women made their body beautiful or clean or whatever by using honey beeswax. So I took the hives in my house and I made honey beeswax. I added rose water and aloe juice, but I forgot, I didn't realize that bo birds, you know, bees don't clean their feet when they go back into the hives, so all these little black bits floating around everywhere. So this little notice said, don't worry about the black bits, they're just the bees, you know, they forgot to wipe their feet on the, on the, you know, before they get into the hives. So we were forgiven all the time because the stories we told were human scale, were, um, we were just making messes of, of problems and, and faults. I mean, we had a shampoo called degreasant shampoo. Who in the hell would ever buy a decreasing shampoo? But somehow or another, that shop, had a sort of energy. And one of the, I came to the shop being an activist, as I said, fighting for setting up, setting up shelter in America, uh, in the UK. You know, shelter, the invasion, many of you have known about the invasion of, of Center Point in London, some of you are that age, and it was planned in my hotel, in my little, well, not really a hotel, it was like more like 40 Towers, um, in Little Hampton. So, the outrage that I had, the empathy with the human condition, was translated into the body shop. And the body shop was always a communications company, never a product-led company until the last five years. And we stood by our products for their efficacy. You know, what can you say about a shampoo? That it cleans the hair. You know, what can you say about a moisture cream? That it just moisturizes the skin. So with that sort of puritanical language we use, but what we did was we stood on them for social change. And we did the most brilliant, brilliant thing. We turned our shops into action stations. We, and this is the wisdom I garnered from my travels, that the well in a traditional society is where all the gossip has, where people come and chat and exchange information. So for me, the best type of the body shop was when the shops were like the well in a traditional society. And the best we could do is better than you ever uh, imagined. And when, when you can change a law in the United Kingdom, as we did, with four million people coming out and, champ and challenging the law on animal testing and banning it, that no longer is animal testing allowed in the cosmetic industry. We, we nearly, nearly changed the law in Europe, except that we too much navel gazing to realize this great black cloud that was coming uh, above us, which was a World Trade Organization that 
you know, changed any law, any environmental law, any human rights law if it deemed to get in the way of trade. So we were a bit stupid there. We changed, we, we raised, I mean, I don't know about you and NGOs, but 12 million people came into our stores alongside Amnesty. 12 million people to sign petitions, leave a thumbprint, but to support human rights defenders. These are no mealy mouth numbers. These are big numbers. And this, more than anything, what this did in our, commun in our com company was shown that the young people, mostly under 25, mostly female, whose ethics are care, that they had a sort of new way of working. They had a Monday to Friday living, not a Monday to Friday dying. That they measured, they saw what power was. They saw how power was defined in barrels of oil and numbers and stock market numbers, and they want no part of it. They saw power in music, they saw power in dreams, they saw power in taking their ability to change, to be part of a social experiment, to change the way things are. And to this day, I look back and still look forward to the body shop and think of those thousands of body shop staff who've gone to the, the epicenters of, of terror, the Balkan states in East Timor, and worked with children and worked with children and uh, education through play. I, you know, I tell you, nobody in the world wants to go to Albania. It is the armpit of Europe. And nobody in the world wants to work in mental institutions in Albania. But seeing the work our employees did on their sabbaticals that they had, I, it makes them, turns them, it sort of protects them into saying activism, having a passion for care on something beyond their own self-development, is to me one of the great spiritual endeavors. Now, when you talk about spirituality in business, you've got to be really careful, really careful. But if you define it, as Mahatma Gandhi defined it, which is in service to the weak and the poor, in service to the weak and the poor. I think there are many organizations, and I think in many cases the body shop, the staff have come out with a spiritual relationship that the first thing they want to do is leave the body shop, which is sad, and they want to join the NGO movement, which is great, uh, which is probably the best thing that's happened in my lifetime, the growth of the NGO movement. So uh, when I was looking at these millions of bottles of products I was making, I think, how do you bring values into something essentially non-valuable? What, what can you do? I mean, it's not like food. It's not like um, medicine. The best thing, I thought, was if we can find a trading relationship with pharma communities and cooperatives, if we can say what we're looking for is a butter or a nut or a plant or an oil, directly trade with those relationships and so making it like a purchasing relationship directly talk to them, metaphorically take tea with them for a year or two and say, you know, what is it you need? What is the price you need per ton or per kilo? What can you do? What can't you do? And this to me is the most human form of trading that I can ever have ever encountered. And if every business looked at ways of dealing directly with the community and depending in, not in, in rising or raising up these small scale economic initiatives, I think Honest to God, I think this is the light at the end of the tunnel. This is when you bring the poor in as active participants, when you bring the poor in as leaders. And one of the greatest tragedies is that we have a complete death of the family farm. Everywhere in the world, the family farm is disappearing. Whether it's in America with the black family farmers, they've gone, almost. Or in England, or I, I would see everywhere in the world with the rise of the big agribusinesses and the corporate theft, theft thieving going on in the agribusinesses. So I found a way of bringing values into something essentially non-valuable, which is developing these, these community trade projects. And I'll give you a quick example of why it works. And I'll pose you a question why I can't get it embedded into the mindset of other businesses. It works because this. When you deal, when you work with a cooperative, it's the community that protects itself. So the first thing they do when you trade with them and you pay them the money that you owe them, or put the money in advance. The first thing they do is the protection of the child. The first thing I've seen is, number one, veterinary clinics, because they depend on the livestock. And in one of our projects in India, in Tamil Nadu, 17,000 livestock were treated this year. The second thing they do is build schools, Montessori schools, community schools, where kids go to. The third thing is HIV and AIDS awareness clinics are usually established right next to garages where truck drivers t tend to pass on AIDS in many countries. Now, they educate, they protect, they keep the culture intact, they're not swarming into the cities. It works. It works. 
And for five years, I've been trying to get Avon Cosmetics, who is a brilliant, I mean, amazingly successful com company, doing extraordinary work in, in, in creating jobs, but cannot get any cosmetic company to come and work alongside me or buy the product from the Nicaraguan the, uh, farmers for sesame oil or the shea nut gatherers in Ghana or whatever. I just can't get it through to them. And maybe there is, again, the poverty of imagination. Now, compared to it, and all of these projects that we have, this is the outcome of it, to one of the biggest, most powerful, most, I don't know how many most they've got attached to their name, Shell organization in, let's say, Nigeria. Billions of barrels of oil extracted since 1955. Billions of dollars in wealth created. Not one bloody penny has gone back to cleaning up their own mess. So if you go to, go to Port Hardcourt and you go to Agoni land where 50, 500,000 unrepresented people and a nation, the Agoni people, live, where the, the oil is extracted and stolen from their land, you go into the hospitals and you see nothing in their operating theater where women are having cesarean operations without any anesthetics. When the, these are the nations, the Nigerian nations, leaders and, and poets and writers, you go into the schools and the kids are building their own desks and writing like some Neanderthal, their, their images or their notes or their numbers or their, or their letters on the side of walls. I don't know about you, but this deeply, deeply, deeply pisses me off. I take this personally. I take the way businesses run roughshod of indigenous communities, countries where they, want to, where they don't want to trade, I, I take this personally. And I think what we've got to do in business now, because it is so powerful, it's powerful than any other social institution. It's more powerful than governments. Governments are economic governments, as I said. It's more powerful than religion. And what it has to have is a moral sympathy for everything it does, because everything you do in business ripple effects and affects everything. Now, there's, because I'm Italian, I'm, I'm pathologically optimistic, there's some light at the end of the tunnel. And the two lights, one is, as I said, the, the, the localization now, the understanding that the local is more important than this mantra of the global, which means that the rich survive and make things, get things cheaper and the local is ignored. But the local is raising its head, whether it's in the social forums around the world or whether it's in the m small antidotes to protecting the local through the slow food movement in Italy or the slow city movement in, in in um, um, Spain and southern, and southern Italy. They're, they're rising their head. This grassroots movement, I believe, is happening. So economic initiatives, local economic initiatives, as I think, are like the other, which I think is amazing, which the media will not talk about, don't even know about, is this rise and the rise and the rise of the vigilante consumer. And they're the ethical watchdogs. They're not only boycotting, which in many cases doesn't work and shouldn't be pursued, but they are campaigning, they're funding, they're, they're aggregating for a new way of ethical business. And they're pointing their finger, not at governments, because governments are bloody useless at this stuff. They're pointing their fingers directly at organizations, corporations, and, and pointing to their behavior. People no longer just want to feel sympathy with a the product, they want to feel sympathy with a company. That's this giant leap which the NGO movement has been paramount. And only at this ethical uh, a consumer, they're working alongside, as I said, these, this extraordinary growth of the NGO. Now, when I was a kid, there would probably be one charity raising money for a, you know, a poor village in Africa. 40,000 NGOs just working on environmental issues. 40,000. One fax by Greenpeace to Unilever was enough to stop them putting genetically modified ingredients into baby food. That is powerful. That is powerful. So I, I'm believing that this, and, and in any, in any, in any uh, Mori poll or in any um, whatever it is in England, governments are no longer believed no longer have any the trust of the nation, neither are businesses. You know, they're just a, a machine for extracting money, not, every, not for their shareholder anymore. Now it seems with their, this executive committee with these obscene pay packages, you know, with this legitimate thieving and corporate crimes that they can conduct. They believe the NGOs. They're the moral indicator of our, of our organization, of our country. And I believe any company worth its weight now has to bring the NGO movement to listen to these people into their business practices. 
because there's no leadership in government. And there's, no, there's no corporate code of governance with teeth to it. It's, it's not a legal binding that says you are not allowed to use child sweatshop labor. Oh no, in fact, the, I, uh, I as a company ca uh, have my entire company protected in the courts of law to protect my brand name, my logo. But there's nothing for a 12-year-old kid sweating in some sweatshop in Bangladesh to protect that child. There's nothing for an indigenous person to protect their intellectual property rights. And I believe that there is a, there is, there is movement with social responsibility, but I'm ambivalent about it now. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when we were the architects of it, it was so heady, it was so exciting. It was, how do you make business kinder? Working alongside progressive businesses, especially in America, being incredibly influenced by the Scandinavian business practices, looking at the cooperative movement, looking at the Fair Trade Association, well, they weren't then, but the cooperative movement, you know, aligning ourselves to, to progressive, um, uh, professors and academics. We didn't find too much going on in business schools, but it was a heady time. We were changing the language of business, trying to put idealism back on the business agenda. And then suddenly, in the last, I would say, six years, things have changed. It's been corralled, it's been stolen by the, by the auditing process of many of these management consultants, KPMG, PricewaterhouseCoopers, Arthur Anderson have stolen this extraordinary peripheral movement just before it became a mass movement uh, into uh, the auditing process. I mean, the auditing process is numbers going mad. They're auditing themselves out of, everything is audited. And, and it's never about how do you change a business from within. It was always just about measuring at one sense of a moment in time a, a corporation's behavior. And why it failed, is failing is because it's not transparent. People want to know information and they want it transparent to everyone. And the media, unfortunately, were some of the reasons why the, co the nails are in the coffin because when you became transparent in the first early days, whether it was Ben and Jerry's ice cream or whether it was Body Shop or whether it's, you know, whatever company was doing this social auditing and you made it transparent, they treated it like a gotcha press. They were saying, ah, the Body Shop, says there's 7% of their suppliers think there's illegal activities going on, or the body shop, they're lousy at their education process, or whatever. So the media, unfortunately, also made us feel that there was a terroris terrorism in time. Um, you know, if you want to be a, a great, responsible company, but you've got to do it now. So there was no reflection. There was no sense of um, thoughtfulness of a process. So. Where does it stand? I think it's just got to come out of the closet. I think uh, the, the NGO movement has got to really try and help shape businesses' thinking about how we get a more corporate code of conduct with, with, with teeth to it. And we've got to make it law, end of story. We've got to make it law. We've got to penalize corporations for the damage that they do, for the deaths that they create, for the murders they commit, for the thieving that goes on. And we've got to define and find the great stories of those companies that are doing great things. And I, for me, I've changed. I just want to celebrate any, any approximate solution to any of these problems. I don't give a damn if a company is wholly great and if they're just partially doing the good work, I will celebrate them. Diageo, which is a big company in England, finally, which sell, you know, alcohol, John da um, Jack Daniels, they, they're, they're not, you know, my favorite company because they're selling alcohol, but my God, do I praise them from the rooftops of what they've done in South Africa with their HIV and AIDS program in terms of their uh, cocktail of drugs that they not only give to their employees, everybody that works with them in South Africa, but their employees' families and the employees that used to work for them, that should be celebrated from the rooftop. So am I optimistic? I'm optimistic when you think of this grassroots revolution re re redefining democracy. I'm optimistic when I see, um, definitely see this real surge of the local reclaiming, them, reclaiming the rights that they have. I'm not optimistic when I see the Bush administration. I'm not optimistic when I see Blair or hear of Blair and his dedication to genetically modified ingredients. I'm definitely not optimistic when I hear anything from Berlusconi but, and the right-wing movement in some of the wonderful socialist countries up in the northern Scandinavian. But I'm Italian and I eat tomatoes and therefore I'm optimistic. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Anita. Um, okay, now it's question time. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, please go up to the microphone at the, um, the microphone. Um, and please give us your name and um, the organization you're representing. Oh, no one. No one wants to ask a question. Oh, good. Not just yet. Hi, um, my name is James Easton, World Vision. I, I believe the Bhutanese have a, um, an index called the Gross uh, National Happiness, happiness. happiness Index, yeah. and uh, rather than the GNP. Yeah. I was wondering if there's a time coming when you think that maybe countries will have a, a, a GNH index. Well, at this moment when economics override everything, um, I don't think so. But I think those are just the right measurements that are needed. I mean, nobody takes them seriously in the, in the city and especially if you're a public listed company, where the creativity comes from is the backbone of any country's economy, which are these small one to 10 employed people. That's where the great economy is. The big organizations, the big Fortune 500 companies are just you know, completely dismissing, downsizing, whatever they want. They call that term their employees. So I think where that could take hold is in within, with these small companies that really are the most creative companies out now. I mean, this the boredom, the giantism that is in these big corporations. And unfortunately, when a corporation or a company gets big, hierarchy com comes in place miraculously. And that's when rules and regulations come in. So creative thinking, like you've described, isn't part of the state or the modus operandi, but it is exactly the language that is needed. And you know, and I, I've never found one, one piece of legal material that says any company has to, by law, maximize its profits. I've never found that. Maximize its profits. If my company wanted to maximize profits, they'd make anti-aging creams, which, by the way, don't work. And better to buy a great bottle of Pinot Noir or Chardonnay, because it's a lie. And I think it was there just to put to God to find out for women who are really stupid. You want to buy this product, now more expensive than gold, you know, get rid of your wrinkles from arguing with her husband or, or environmental pollution and by the way you can put it on your breasts and they magically grow or put it on your thighs and they disappear can't be done but it's you know by repetition people women believe it can so until you get this real creative thinking in anything turning everything upside down going in the opposite direction and then if you get groups of small companies like the groups that were part of the original social venture network well, when they were not ashamed or frightened but we're proud to bring these new measurements in, then I think it would happen. But you know, unfortunately, we get no mention of these ideas, these really revolutionary ideas in business journals like, you know, um, investment journals like Forbes or Fortune, Harvard Business Review, any of those deemed respectable journals would never print anything as radical as that. Uh, Doug Sanders from Chulalongkorn University. Um, I wondered if anyone has done an assessment of, uh, of the old bottom line. Uh, Body Shop has been um, extremely successful as, uh, in, in niche marketing terms. And we have the spread of the fair trade movement that, that you alluded to. Uh, where back in Vancouver where I used to live uh, you know you, you could buy more expensive coffee that was fair trade coffee um, and I didn't see many people doing it uh, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry this I, I loved your talk but I, I wonder if anyone has has crunched numbers which you don't want people to live by but if anyone has crunched numbers on the extent to which um, these alternative systems which have emerged and you know there was a story I think uh, God, it might have been even in the in the Wall Street Journal about a nun in Paris who 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 you know on her computer worked out an ethical investing system but has and and, and this has been changing so much developing so much has anybody tried to work out the economics of this change? How, you know, uh, is, it, is it just going to be marginal? 
Um, is it going to be more than marginal? Right, th two or three responses. One is body shop is not niche. When you have 2,000 stores in 54 countries and doing a hell of a lot of good uh, trading, it's no longer niche. So maybe your definition of niche is different from mine. Uh, community uh, fair trading is the growing part of the market, especially in the coffee industry. If only Starbucks would take fair, fair traded coffee as, a pos as an option for a cup of coffee in, you know, rather than a little bag of coffee at Christmas time, things would change. Ethical investors, um, I think, stand to lose less money than ordinary investors. Um, it's slow. It's slow, and I don't think it's necessarily expensive. I know, I know many organizations which willy-nilly, you know, uh, you know, just get rid of money. Who's the guy from, um, is it Ken Lay, who had bought his bloody, you know, umbrella stand for 150,000 pounds? I mean, there's great waste of money in business, and it always me, seems to me that there's a terrorism of the ore. You know, you've got to be able to be profitable, highly profitable, big, and or you're going to fail, you're just going to be niche. Well, I think there's a genius in the end. You can do both. And I think what you have, what you're explaining, is a hurry sickness in business, especially if you're a, uh, where everything has to be produced fast. Sometimes a movement takes 10 years, 15 years, and this is a consciousness-raising movement. This isn't easy. This is about, queer. hey, girl, what's our profit every six months if you're on the stock market? So I believe this is 10 years ago it didn't exist. Ten, now everybody understands fair traded coffee and the price. You know, I know plenty of people that spend $15 getting their bloody car park valeted in, in America and, you know, don't whinge about that or spending it on a great bottle of Pinot Noir and don't whinge about that and never ever look at comparison of prices in wine. So why do they worry about coffee? Um, so I think that, you know, you're, I don't know, you're, you're Canadian, so you're not American, obviously. And I remember, <laughs> that's a bit stupid. Um, John F. Kennedy said something which I keep repeating because I think it's so profound. He said, the opposite to the truth is not the lie, big and bold. It is the repeated myth, repeated and repeated. So people think it is the truth. This notion that everything is more expensive. You know, and it's a few pennies, so what? There's some things we never consider worrying about how much it costs. Pack it a cigarette. I don't know how much this costs, but it's, it's not only a killer, but we never worry about the price, and yet we're starting to worry about things like some of our commodities that might be a bit more expensive. So I'm optimistic. I have to be optimistic, because the thought of the world's economy is run by these giant handful of corporations would drive me to death. Suicide, actually. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Chris Bruton, uh, Economist Corporate Network. Um, a number of major companies, uh, I mean, we could mention Nike, for example, and, and some of the companies in the clothing industry, um, they established factories in developing countries like Indonesia or Cambodia, for example. They pay the going wage, which is usually about $40 a month, which is just over a dollar a day. They give labor, uh, they give employment, they give income to families, but they're very often criticized because they are not paying the kind of wages you pay in Britain or North America or Australia. Do you feel that there are, are as it were, double standards in corporate experience which allow companies to operate at different standards in different countries, helping those countries, helping those people to gain employment, but obviously not offering them the kind of benefits that they would offer back home? Because if they did, they wouldn't bother uh, to invest, invest in these developing countries. How would you respond to oh. that situation? I mean, if we take the extreme case, it's sometimes said in some of those South Asian countries where children sit making carpets, that if we don't allow the children to make carpets, the families starve. I mean, a difficult one. Could, could we have your oh, views on that? I don't think that? it's difficult. I think it's a, moral, it's a moral question. I don't believe any company should apply the standards that are different in their own country, and environmental standards and human rights standards. I don't believe that. I passionately don't believe that. I come in with a culture shaped by Christianity, Judaism, Islam, and every one of those culture, those religions, have had, have had one line that is uniform to every other, which is kindness and consideration and thoughtfulness. Now, I've just come out of, out of Bangladesh, which is the country most used for the garment industry. 
and I see what it is like to live on a dollar a day. You're absolutely right. Nobody's going to, you know, countries, companies are looking for, you know, the race to the bottom. You know, the countries that have the least environmental standards, passive and docile workers, anywhere where they have to pay less money. Let me tell you, a dollar a day is not a living wage. So all I'm saying is they don't have to pay, of course, in merit. They need the bread basket that that country needs, which has has to be about the right, the ability to save, the ability to educate their kids, the ability to have good housing, and I don't mean Western housing. When you go into the factories I've seen in Bangladesh and see the products being made by Asda, being made by Walmart, and they're fantastic, uh, fantastic um, factories, but when you see the precision and the determination of the workforce and the workers, and you go back to their slums, and they are slums. I mean, I don't know about you, but going on to the, in the Bangladeshi um, uh, sort of toxic waste dumps and seeing whole cities being built on bamboo stilts with just room after room, nothing in them at all, no electricity, no gas, no water, just a bed where the kids are sleeping and the mothers are sleeping, where they walk down a passageway as wide as this table where they can see through the cracks of the planks, there's toxic waste dumps, there's sewage, these dead rats, where they're defecating in one part and then cooking their rice in the other. I don't know about you, but I think everybody should be given a living wage. And when you take a look at the amount of money that a factory may, a worker does in terms of the cost of a product, it's usually 1%, 1% of 1%. It's nothing, it's infinitesimal. M when you take a look at the, the markups for for distribution, for, re for, re uh, for retail, for wholesaling, for marketing. That's where the dilemma comes. It isn't about getting a cheaper product. They could get cheaper products. Walmart could keep their products cheap. It's about the greed where they want to maximize their profits. And I think it is, and I, you know, it, you're right. It isn't about giving up a job because this is a disaster. But it's also not sticking onto that as an excuse for paying slavery wages. These are... These are slavery conditions, excuse me, conditions. And, I, and I've seen nothing to, argue, uh, to be argued out of that. Giving them a job. And th when you say giving them a job, you think you romanticize it. A job, you know, you go to work at five, you, nine, you leave at five, you have your wages, you have your overtime, and you have your overtime paid the same week. And you have the right to, you know, have maternity benefits. And because the country's you know, legal system said that, and if you're injured in the workplace, you know, you have the right of the day off, and you know, to get legal, you know, to get medical help, you know, you have the right to organise. Possibly, you have the right to be heard. Forget it. It's not like that. Um, nobody's asking for wages that accumulate the same standards as the West, but they want that. You know, one woman said to me in Nicaragua, in the so-called free zones. You know, isn't that a lovely term, free zones, slavery zones? She said, tell anybody, wherever you are, all we want to do is move from slavery to poverty. And I, you know, that's a profound statement from a Nicaraguan worker. So the answer is keep the jobs. Absolutely. The answer is to get the buyers and the factory owners in some sort of complicit arrangement where they are paying a living wage in that area. And I don't think it would affect any, any profit system. Well, maybe a... You know, for, you know, Walmart, was it, 27 billion bloody dollars profit? How much can you do with that money? I mean, maybe a half a billion can go, a million can go back in paying a living wage. I know about greed, greed. You know, the problem with wealth isn't the wealth, it's greed. That is the problem. It's great to be rich. It gives you, it gives you freedom, spontaneity. But it is greed, that accumulation of money for money's sake. That's my dilemma. I'm sure that was impassioned, but probably didn't answer your question. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Paul Martin from PR and Associates. I would like to um, uh, ask you the same question than this gentleman in a bit different way. If someone in a developing country, even in a least developed country, um, has an alternative between having a very low paid job locally and a slightly higher paid job with a multinational, what would be your opinion? Should he take the job with a multinational or should he, should he keep his low paid job look, that is supplied locally? Absolutely take the highest paid job. 
you know, and I'm not an idealist, you know, when you talk to any family in the poverty-stricken areas, you know, they just want any, any reason for survival. You know, they're not going to take these, um, he's walking out. Is he walking out? Oh, so? He didn't really want to listen to me. Okay, I'll, I'll go to the next one. <laughs> That's bizarre. Um, so I would, you know, who am I to say what they need to do? You know, uh, if they wanted to, I, it's a bizarre question because that's a, a question that I can't answer. Okay, so I'm going to say it a bit more accurately then. Yeah. Um, a few years ago, I was studying in the development school of, uh, okay, school of development studies back in England. And uh, there was people from Sri Lanka and India yeah. who listened to our arguments who were say all saying this is not fair. There shouldn't be any um, trade um, going, um, to, um, doing um, trade between some developing countries and um, and the and the West, yeah. because uh, the, some children are working in these companies. We shouldn't buy these products. And then these people from Sri Lanka, India, told us, but you have to understand that people who are taking these jobs, even if they are still children, they have to survive and they have a family to raise, and they have to help their parents. And what is your opinion? Do you think that the multinationals should stop investing because some people who are, who are not in age of working wants to work for these companies? You know, I, I, I somehow think this is um, disingenuous because it's taking a, a multinational and saying, should they not invest in their companies because they can't use children? My God, if they're not the richest organizations in the world, then maybe they could employ, you know, uh, adults. I don't think that's the question. The question is, I believe, is do we as the West, who are you know, the multinationals, did they have the right to go into a country and ignore its laws, in many cases its labor laws, as they did in Guatemala, as they did in Nicaragua, as they did in um, Honduras, did they ignore the labor laws uh, because they can buy their way into the government, as they've done in Nicaragua, they built the whole government building. Um, can they do that and get away with it? and change some of the great social institutions of a country, I believe that's wrong. I believe that's wrong. I believe a multinational is so wealthy uh, that uh, the labor costs of any uh, of these companies is so minuscule. I just, what I don't understand, if it's so minuscule, why aren't they just more generous? What stops them as a human being, as a father, as a good person in their society? Why do they, is it a racist component? Do they think anybody that's dark, anybody that's another color doesn't deserve to have a fulfilling life? That's the question I'm asking. And I don't believe, I don't believe you should ever boycott because I think that's dangerous, but I believe we should be absolutely challenging the factories and the buyers to say nothing should come out of this, these countries or into our own Western countries if they have the stain of human rights abuse or sweatshop because every one of us can afford it. They can afford it. And this belief that all these products would be more expensive in America is bull. It just means that the profits are a little bit less. Thank you. Um, my name's Karishma, I work for the UN. Um, arguably, the philosophies of the body shop encourage a kind of um, armchair approach to social responsibility, but like I'm referring to the customers. So I'm thinking it might be possible that a percentage of your customers go into the body shop, purchase a facial scrub, and come out thinking they've made the world a better place. Well, let me tell you, I wish to God there were activists. 90% of them come in because they like the product and probably don't give a toss, especially in middle America and most other countries. They don't give a damn, they just want a good product. That's life. You know, that's not, we're not doing this for the, for the customer. We're doing this because it's the right thing to do. And you know, and if they're armchair, you know, I don't care. I don't care if anybody's whether they're an activist or a citizen, as long as they're doing something, for you know, to make somebody's life more honourable or more just or more secure or more e or easier, then that's okay by me. I don't think anybody, in reality, you know, comes into the body shop. Maybe a very small, but they're not the buyers. You know, they're the they're the talkers. They're the chatterers. They're the you know, this, this group of people that sit around talking about these issues. 
You know, I wish we could got every, I wish we'd get everybody from the UN coming into our shops. I wish we'd got everybody from Greenpeace or Friends of the Earth or Amnesty. But is it, life isn't like that. They come in because they like the product, or they come in because it's cheaper, or or whatever. So I don't think we're encouraging armchair activism or armchair indifference. And if they do come in and they think they're doing their bit, they're buying a community trade project, they, product, they are. But I don't believe it's like that. If it is, so be it. But that's not going to change the world. It's the it's the institutions that will change. Have to change. Anita, my name's Tom Bingham. Um, you've given the multinationals good kicking tonight. And um, as someone who works for a multinational, I'm only up here because I work for Diageo and you had something vaguely good to say about us. But um, my question is about um, NGOs. You, you, you praise them um, a lot. And at, at Diageo, well, I am I'm very proud and passionate of, of the drinks we sell and, and the joy it brings to a lot of people. We're also aware... You've got a lot of friends. We're enjoying them here. But we're also aware that those drinks do cause problems. And the, the problem I'm finding is that the people at the NGOs are as ambitious and driven as any uh, middle manager. And we are trying to uh, promote responsible consumption and are passionate about it. And many NGOs will not go even look at cooperation to try and work together to solve this problem. I wonder what your views were on that. Um. It's a sort of like this, the lady asked me, it's similar, there's a sort of like, I don't know, it's like tokenism, a lot will say, we won't, you know, we won't come to you because we don't want to be involved in alcohol or, or tobacco industry, or, you know, the usual set of uh, devils. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm a different nature than this. I, I said, so I'm getting older, maybe I'm just no longer wanting to change the world, I just want to make, you know, do one thing good. I believe that we praise any approximate solution. Like I said, that Diageo was an example of that. I praise now Shell, even though it was my battlefield enemy, um, because of their stand on global warming, whereas ExxonMobil is still dickhead stupid on this and still believes that fossil fuels have nothing to do with global warming. So, I mean, there, there's a sort of a roundabout. I, you know, I think for the NGO movement, there's so little money being given to the NGO movement because most of it is now going into the big multinationals creating their own NGOs and fueling the money that way. I think there are some standards you have to have. For me personally, it is, you know, armaments industry. Anything to do with the creation of the loss of a human life is no-no. Tobacco is a problem because it's a killing, is a product that kills you and through excess. And it always amazes me about alcohol, because that also kills you with excess. But they're the only two ingredients that by law are protected for having an ingredient list, only two products. I've got to make these silly shampoos, and I've got to have all my ingredients listed because of public health and information. Why don't they list ingredients, of sort of 200 odd ingredients in a tobacco, or how many, anyway, that's just by the by. Um, you're right, um, but I think, you know, I've gone to Diageo for help and some ideas. I haven't got the money, even though one of your board members is on my board. Um, maybe you're just not charming enough. Or maybe Diageo isn't charming enough. I know who would, you know, there's, there's a well, piece uh, you would like to have. I mean, we're having a hard time raising money for this incredible um, initiative on the International Peace Foundation. Put your money where your mouth is, eh? Let's have a chat afterwards. <laughs> but you're right, you're right, things will change. The big, you know, who are the big, um, the big evil is the oily gaki now, the oil industry. Pharmaceutical industry is coming. See, you can look at this, this spectrum as what was anonymous 10 years ago is no longer anonymous now. Um, hi, good evening. I'm Amy Kasman. I'm the Financial Times correspondent here in Bangkok. But, um, and a lot of people have asked you very serious questions on, on quite important topics here tonight. I hope you won't mind if I ask you a question more from my perspective as, as a woman living in Bangkok. Um, a lot of women normally deny themselves a lot of things that they want to eat in order to fit into feminine notions of beauty and keep their figures. And I can't help but noticing that every cosmetics shop that I go into, including Body Shop, but also others, seem to offer a delicious array of products, mostly based on things that we think we can't eat. Olive oil and almonds and cocoa butter and honey face masks. And I'd 
like to know whether it's the psychology of cosmetic marketing companies to offer women the products to put on their body that they think that they can't put in it. <laughs> okay. You want to know the answer to that? Okay. Cosmetics is the first cousin to food. What a traditionally you used to eat, you used to rub on your body. Whether it was in, you know, whether in Elizabethan times and they would rub chamomile on their body, or whether in, whatever you can cook with, whatever you can grow in your kitchen garden, and kitchen cosmetics were the basis of it. So we've got, um, in, certainly in the body shop, we've used uh, c um, food stuff, fruit stuff, fruit pulps, because it's, you know, it's far better using food ingredients and having a, another pharmaceutical ingredient which you know some stage down the line has been animal tested. So you're right, but it's also familiar because you can actually pronounce the word. You try a chemical word that nobody knows what it is. So, and I, I love having this visual of what, you know, if you go into Ghana where the women who describe themselves as beautiful if and only if they're, they're, they walk like their bums are chewing gum. That, and they rub this shea butter on their bodies and they rub their shea butter on their... And they also cook with it. So, um, yeah, it's, it's because it's, was, it was the first... It was how it started in the first place. You can have almost anything. If you've got a partner that has bad odour in his socks, just take some ivy if it ever grows in this area and just soak it in hot water, brew it up and put the socks in and all the smell goes. You can use mayonnaise on your hair, terrific for a, for a conditioner. You can, you can well, salt is probably the best exfoliator. Look, this man is falling asleep on these beauty tips here. <laughs> uh, salt and sugar, sugar is a humectant that grabs moisture out of the air. So yeah, it works. Can I just then ask a follow-up, which is, do you expect to be um, releasing any like chocolate mud cake fudge no, face mask no. anytime soon? We did have a chemist that was obsessed with uh, with chocolate, but I didn't think she had a sod, um, a severe, you know, good sex life probably. But I'm ob obsessed with yogurt. I think if you go into Pakistan or any of those uh, and northern India, yogurt is one of being the main main ingredients to clean and to and to polish the body. So I've been trying to get my my company to. If you go to some organic dairy farmers, small dairy farmers in England and produce a yogurt range, but it hasn't happened yet. But it will. Chocolate. I can't think of anything more sickly than licking chocolate. Oh, sorry, I mean putting on your smelling chocolate. Uh, uh, bergamot. Now, excuse me, before you ask the question, bergamot. We've got a community trade in southern Regia, Regia Calabria, and the bergamot is so magical. It's this orange that you can't eat because there's nothing to eat in there, and it's too acid. But it's the volatile oil that comes out of the skin. And, we, and it was, it's the basis of Earl Grey tea, we put bergamot in there. And it was, it's, it's magic because it fixes perfumes. When you make a perfume, it's got 20, 30, 40, 50 ingredients. You put bergamot oil in, it fixes it all together. But when we opened up the community trade project there, and we were opening up a body shop in Milan, all of the guys, you know, the Italians are so cocky. They think they're, you know, God's gift. Their mother's telling them they're Jesus Christ incarnate. So they used to come into the Milan body shop and they used to take off their shirt and they'd take bergamot and shove it down their pants because bergamot is their version of Viagra. So <laughs> that was a little story of Italian men and Viagra. Yes, sorry. Yeah. Hi, my name's Emma. Um, I've got a practical question, first of all, is when you the body shop organization goes to villages. How do you select, but if you're in a district area, you've got three or four different villages, different groups of women producing different products. How do you select which ones you choose? And also on the same question, but a different level with your companies, who supplies your plastic bottles? Who does your labeling? How can you ensure, especially now, um, that you're sourcing from ethical businesses? Um. The first answer, the first part of the question, is we work with fair trade associations, Oxfam Trade in Max Haval, and so we tend to go in with a partner now that works in development, and we then specifically are looking at cooperative, the cooperative movement, um, and then the rest is luck. You know, when I visited Kumasi in northern in Ghana, and then up to the northern part, it was just where I was making a film for BBC, and I went there and I saw it and I thought this is a great idea. 
and so then we, that's developed. So it's sometimes luck, but sometimes it's working with the development movement. Mostly it's that. Very rarely now do we do our own community trade on our own. And I think when there's an infrastructure in place, it works even better. So you have to also look for leaders in that community because nothing works unless there's leadership in that community. The response to the other question, we manufacture everything. 99.9% um, is manufactured in England. So the bottles are manufactured there, the labeling is done actually in, in situ in the, in the um, factory in England. Is that, what, is that the question you asked yeah, about the label? My second question was about, uh, you explained quite clearly how the corporate social responsibility sector, right. if you like, in the development oh, world you mean how became, I ordered it. became quite corporatized very quickly yeah. in order for the multinationals to protect themselves. As an NGO worker who's been working with mainly the British major NGOs for the last eight years, I feel I've witnessed the same process in the, I can't, I'm not going to name them here, in the same international, the same national NGOs working in Britain and around the world, especially with the World Bank and p taking on participation, taking on the, even the speech, like the one dollar a day, that was set by the World Bank. It wasn't set by any grassroots organization. And yet it's a phrase that we all throw about freely. Aren't we in danger of having a corporatized NGO sector as well? I'm sure we are. But I'm, I still believe that we have less danger from them uh, than we have from our multinational corporations. Um, I, you know, at the moment, I just want to support what's the, who are on the side of the angels. Maybe that will happen in the future. I don't think so, not with the groups that we work with. We wouldn't breathe without, if we're doing a climate change campaign without Greenpeace helping us. We wouldn't breathe without doing any work on human rights or campaigning on... Uh, human rights unless amnesty is checking everything we're doing. I guess you make your, you decide who you're going to go to bed with in that time. In the development area, it is pretty sophisticated, rural development, women in development, and the, the, the methodology or the groups are well in place, whether it's um, the one, it's some good ones in Canada that you work with, whether some of the Catholic organizations. So, you know, and we're quite well known in, in the area, cert certainly in Africa and certainly India. So maybe it is going to happen, but at the moment I'm not seeing it happening. I'm more worried about the phony NGOs that are being um, sort of designed by the, by the big oil industry. I mean, Shell is, is, is positive proof that they're coming up with their own NGO you know, groups that they're supporting. So that's what worries me more, but you know, it's certainly a valid question, but I haven't the answer to that. At the moment I'm not worried, I'm still in love with them. Hello, Anita. I also work for an NGO um, here in Bangkok for the Human Development Foundation, um, which has been going for about 30 years. Um, it's possibly going to be a bit repetitive from the lady from before, but essentially you've been talking about all um, business relationships and even individual relationships are about, are about trading. And what I really want to know is um, we've struggled for 30 years to try and trade with um, private organisations and whether you can suggest any good ways where I, whether we as an organisation can get that in a way that possibly you, you've listened to NGOs in the past? I would help you. Just tell me what you do, what you sell, what you trade, and I'll help you. I'll give you my card. We can start Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, good evening. My name is David Schwarzenschuber. I'm an editor with UCAN News. That's the news service of the Catholic Church in Asia. But over and above that, um, my family's been in the wine business over 500 years and I'm trying to start it in northern Thailand. You want family farms. Do you understand that most of the wineries in the world and the vineyards are family enterprises? It happens without doubt that wine contains alcohol. And I've got 90 studies in my library at home that moderate consumption of alcohol extends life rather than take a tranquilizer which is manufactured by a big company drink a glass of wine from a family winery and what you've been saying goes against 500 years of my family heritage and what I can see on the ground today isn't it amazing that we're not hearing each other and we I'm hearing you language. most no, of, no. Mo most I of what I you said I agree with but you know when you talk about the family farm 
and you've got the growth of the alcohol, the wine. I've got a vineyard, it's bloody wonderful. Great. It's producing champagne. So I'm not going to be able, not that good, but it's producing it. So um, I'm not against alcohol. I look, okay. The only thing I'm drinking tonight is wine. I think good. you're too purist. You, you know, you know one, of the, one of the real, real definitions of intelligence is not taking things too literally. Okay. You know, so, you know, when I'm talking about the family farm, what, what is your, what is your, what was your beef anyway? What was it? Well, you said alcohol was bad, and I'm no, saying... No, I didn't know. I love alcohol. Tobacco and alcohol no, you were No, the gentleman down. was saying that those are the companies that can't, that uh, uh. organizations don't demand sponsorship because they're part of the, the heinous uh -huh. devils. And I'm saying, you know, here already we've got an organization that is one of the most profoundly innovative organizations for peace. They're strapped. Nobody can not get money out of mm -hmm. most people. And I'm thinking, let's do a deal. Maybe it's not going to be right, but let's do a deal. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you didn't hear what I was saying. Okay. That's it. Wine. Okay. And my wine is better than your wine. <laughs> Hi, my name's Alina. I work for the World Conservation Union. Earlier today, we were talking about $1 a day as a minimum wage. I was just wondering, with the community trade that Body Shop does, can you give us an example of how much more the community benefit from body shop buying Brazilian nuts off them than they would from a um, normal trader? We, we don't pay wages, we pay by tonnage. We used mm. to pay, I don't know, if can't, can't, maybe it's changed now, something like $27 a litre of, of uh, Brazil nut, which I think on the, on the open market was about $12 a litre. So, you know, we're not into, don't, you know, whatever you want to say, check it out. You know, this is not about getting a community, tr a traded project and paying them less. It's about what is it worth when a, a Kayapu Indian spends three months taking these bloody huge Brazil nuts, cracking them open, extracting the oil, processing the oil, when they could much rather be fishing most of the time. So, so, is that but, so we don't pay wages, we pay the community. Yeah, no, that's the community meant, deals with us and says what they between, want. Yeah. Um, so is that price reflected in the... In like a lot of people say body shop cost more than other products. No, so is I, it you know, the cost that, of or? the body shop products is the fact that it's manufactured in England. Yeah. That's the dilemma. It's manufactured in England. 90% of it is then shipped to this country. And we have a sub, you know, so that's the dilemma. You know, one of the, you know, transport is expensive. And especially if you're transporting primarily water, it's expensive. Um, Q, have you got any, you know, why are we so expensive here, which is some of the things I've been hearing about? We're not that expensive. Maybe it's a myth. What we have, we have import duties. We have, you know, we have right. that, that, that's what makes it a Could you could you come to the microphone, please? <laughs> my name is my name is Q Shirdel. I'm the managing director of Body Shop Thailand. Uh, the product is not that expensive. What we have to take to consideration is the transportation. The import duties in Thailand are pretty high, and then the markups, which makes us you know, comfortably. Isn't so how that? do we compare to the proprietary brands like, um, what do you call it, Lancome or Estee Lauder or whatever no, they are No, we are, are we are cheaper than them. They're, right. brand, they're really, really premium brands. So where, well, who is cheaper? On well, an local brands are cheaper. Right. There are some local brands which are cheaper than us. There are some imported brands which are cheaper than us. Right. But that's because of their cost. So factor. this is a myth then? Yes. This is a myth, repeated and repeated. Drives me nuts. Okay, right. there we go. Thank you. Okay, I think we... I think we have time just for uh, two more questions. Okay. Um, one last question about why Body Shop is so successful. Because all over UK you see people selling little products from villages in South America. I mean, how did you start? Was it with um, a good team, recruitment consultants? Um, you know, I'd like to know some of the secrets because I bought your products in the UK. You became a high street brand fairly quickly how did uh, i tell you one of the worst things i'll tell you the worst mistakes and that'll give you an idea of the worst two mistakes number one is going on the stock market the worst mistake we ever did because it doesn't allow you to be thoughtful doesn't allow you to take time the media is on you all the time it's not it doesn't allow you reflection the second mistake probably just underneath going public is a hiring management consultants Oh my God, shed loads of money, you know, just lousy consultants. 
And it's like, you know, when you go to bed with somebody, you hope to, hope to God that you know what they're about and you know who they are and you like them. Management consultants invariably come with a template that they want to impose on you. So, so discourse, dialogue before is never the way of the game. So I think when, when we, you give your, leave your company's fortunes to the, to the will of strangers, like these marketing consultants, the major mistake. Starting, there was no marketing department for 18 years. We didn't know what it was. We didn't know if it was an art or a science. It's just communicating an idea and finding guerrilla tactics, which means low-paid tactics to get the message across. Any blank space for us, you know, uh, the side of our, our trucks, anything for getting a message. We never, um, I didn't, I had a team, but my team was mostly my friends. Cause I just want to have fun with my friends. And mostly they were activists because we want to have fun being activists. Um, there wasn't anybody that, we had to employ somebody who understood the numbers because none of us understood anything like that. But mostly it was a creative, it was creative ideas. And the trick for us, the real trick, was going in the opposite direction to the cosmetic industry. Whatever they were saying, we were saying opposite. They were, they were designing, we were designing. They were highly packaged, more packaged than, the cos than confectionery, we were low packaged. Simply because we had to be, because we had no money. Um, they were making their huge profits on anti-aging. We didn't even believe that. We loved aging. We loved the aging population anyway. They had the wisdom. So in those early days when we set up, um, it was set up by terrific imagination um, and a enormous energy. You know, you don't even believe you've got the energy uh, that you have to have and a passion because, you know, it was, it was so, it made you feel alive. Uh, later on, we had to bring in, we did bring in, you know, more professional people. We had somebody, who, instead of, you know, filling the bottles on a hand pump, we got an electric pump. I mean, I tell you, we sh I can't even tell you how we should not have survived. We didn't know what we were doing. But what we had was an enthusiasm, I said. And I've mentioned this time and time again, and I don't think it will register in anybody that isn't strategy or, f or format or processing. It was an enthusiasm that allowed our communication to just shout things from the rooftop. And what we did when we shouted from the rooftop is shout out all of the things that separated us from the competition. Nobody was stupid enough to do five sizes of the same product. They just, it was stupid. But we did it because we wanted to look as if we had more products. Nobody was stupid enough to write handwritten labels and when you put it in the shower, the whole bloody thing ran so you never knew what you bought. Nobody was, you know, all the stupid things we did. It's absolutely stupid. But in the end, they became our myths and they became our stories and they became what was enchanting. There was a grace. We had a grace, which was we didn't know how to tell lies. And we thought you'd go to prison. This is how stupid we were. We thought you'd go to prison in business if you told lies. Now, you think of the cosmetic industry today and, the, and they should get Nobel Prizes for promises at the moment. So I think there was a combination of that um, research, and we always went to the past for a prologue for our ideas. We were absolutely nut. We had social anthropologists working with us, but more than anything, we were part of a social movement, and that where activism was a center point to that. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm afraid that's all. That's all we have time for. Um, any more questions, the answers are going to have to come out of